And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight, coming to us straight from Ciderverse, creator of the of the upcoming comic known as the Colossals. And the and the man who asks if you can hear the call, the one and only Cider Hype himself. How you doing today, man? I'm still alive. How about yourself? I am. Do I am doing good. I have managed to shrug off the pain of the pain of jet lag and the and have submitted the appropriate curse words towards towards ever towards every airline ever for their bias against tall people. Yeah, flight's supposed to be the safest way to travel. Doesn't mean it's the most convenient. No, they just no, they just flat out don't like tall people. Well, it's true. There's like a flying cigar is what they used to call them. Mm -hmm. So, with so with that with that with that in mind, um. One thing that I one thing that I'd like to get that I'd like to get into since I like. To, to go into the humble beginnings, in a sense, is where is where you for, where you first got into co comics, how that happened, and where the writing bug um, bit. Uh, well, uh, it's it's a bit of a downer. <laughs> um, I uh, I grew up down the street from uh, a young girl my family wanted to adopt. She was a foster child, and the foster home was just down the street, mm -hmm. and I. Uh, we used to we used to trade off on making breakfast. I was uh, six years old. She was I was five. She was six. And uh, one day I was on my way up, and and the state came and took her away to be adopted by a different family who had you know beat us to the punch. And uh, it was a little traumatic. You know, the last thing she said to me before they put her in a van was, "Don't let them take me." And um, I didn't see her for nineteen years. I had searched for her for nineteen years. But um, when I was a little kid there, I was to, it was an old country town up in Maine's where I used to live, and uh, hometown, and there was a comic book store there. Uh, a man named Ernie owned it. It's an elderly man at the time, and he had seen me just wandering around so, so devoid of hope, right? Like, this little kid had just had every rainbow, color of the rainbow wrung out of him. And uh, I'm, I'm in there, I'm looking at the stuff he's got in the glass, and he says, hey, have you met my friend? my good friend, Superman, and he points up to the ceiling, and there's a cutout, cardboard cutout of Superman flying over the top, and he's looking down, and he's smiling, and he's winking at, at you. Mm -hmm. And uh, he pulled down a, his copy of Action Comics number one from the top shelf, still in the plastic, and he handed it to me. Little five-year-old kid, peanut butter stained fingers, right? And I laid down on the floor, and I read that comic, and I spent the next five years reading comics on the floor of that comic book shop every superman comic i could get my hands on mm -hmm. that uh that's how i got into into comics that way that guy he just he saw that i needed uh, an impossible hero not just somebody i could i could meet every day a cop or a, or a firefighter but someone that was just so beyond the size of life mm -hmm. to remind me that not all hope is lost you know yeah if you keep, if you keep on, see, I learned from that to have faith in a better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, um, as a young guy, I um, I didn't take to sports. I, I was more interested in reading, and of course, comics were around in my life. So uh, I got into fan fiction. That was really where it got started. I started doing fan fiction for writing assignments in school, and. Um, you know, uh, rewriting like Romeo and Juliet with you know different anime elements and stuff. You know, fourteen-year-old boy stuff. Yeah, and that, uh, I can I can only imagine you're surprised when you when you started finding out about actual anime Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, right. You know, and because uh, like that time it was just Toonami and Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that around. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, so I just I I did that like. That was my writing thing. I submitted a few things when I was younger for poetry competitions, and, and they won, but I just largely did not 
seek like any publishing or anything like that. I didn't think I was worthy of it. Um, like DC would put out these hiring calls like, hey, if you're a writer, show us your stuff. But you have to have this, that, and the next thing and so many years of experience. And I was like, oh, wow, well, I don't even meet the bar to qualify, so I'm not going to bother. Yeah, the experience and, uh, paradox is, is, as I like to call it. Yeah, it's a paradox, all right. It's mind-boggling how they think that ought to work. But uh, so, and then this, this getting into this comic book thing, um, you know, I I've been through some pretty rough stuff. I uh, I have Crohn's in in 2017. I had my uh, colon removed and a lot of the muscle inside there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've had four more abdominal reconstructions since then. Mm-hmm. In 2019. Ethan Van Skyver was telling people in, in, in around and observing the comic skate movement that, you know, quote, you can do this too, mm-hmm. unquote. And I, I never got the whole, like, war against the left or anything like that. It, it's fun, sure, to, to get into the culture war and make it known how you feel, plant your flag. But where I came into this whole comic book writing thing was when I was really down and depressed and I was, you know, not really feeling worthy of the skin I was in. Uh, this stranger on the internet, looking dead on into his webcam, said to me and several other hundred people watching that we could do it too. Mm-hmm. And that's how I found my way into all this mess. Yeah. And you know, with with that kind, with that kind of thing in mind, um, Given given that we're de- given that we're dealing with comics and and this answer has probably been already answered based on what based on what you said before, but it's one of those things I'm legally required to ask. Ah, um, were you a Marvel guy or a DC guy growing up? Ah, uh, DC man, <laughs> hometown heroes. Which, again, that was just one of the things I really enjoyed about them, you know, is that they were, for me growing up, Marvel were the guys that they wanted to fight each other more than they wanted to save kittens from trees and kids and orphans from cliffside bus accidents. Mm-hmm. And that is, that is, that is certainly, that kind of, that kind of thing is certainly, is certainly interesting. It's especially given, um, one of the, one of the other, um, Hero he, types of hero that's that seems to be in, that seems to be an inspiration for for you at least or at least I at least I see the DNA of it in some of the work, and that is the um he, the henshin hero that is typically seen in Tokusatsu. Yes, the um, transform transformation Tokusatsu heroes. Yes. Yeah. Um. How did you How did you first get exposed to that? Uh, like many starry eyed. Uh... Millennials, I came into Mighty Morphin Power Rangers through syndication, and my very first one that I was able to sit through was uh, in space. And from there, I was addicted. I was addicted to the ability of normal people with courageous hearts being able to channel their ambition into raw power and push back against the forces of darkness. That was amazing to me. Anybody could be a Power Ranger. Even the bad guys could be Power Rangers. That was the coolest th- concept to me in that whole thing. And so it swept me away that like old people, young people, uh, women characters, male characters, alien characters, it didn't matter. You could all morph and fight back the darkness. And that just enraptured me. And so as I made it over into like the, the origin of that stuff... All the stuff I loved about Power Rangers was just cranked up to ten over there, and and that just I just almost totally divorced from Power Rangers, and fell in love with the Japanese source material as it just it just resonated with so much passion. It's interest. It's interesting that you bring you bring that kind of thing up, given that one per- one particular avenue with um, Tokusatsu that. That you've re- that you've referenced plenty of times in so- in some of your in some of your avatars and some of your um, tweets that that I've that I've seen of you is common writer. Yes. And the re- the reason the reason I find that int- the reason I find that interesting is that that whole is that is is the fact that it is d- it is the com- is the common mythos that we see that we see uh, that is seen a lot with um. 
with Ka with Common Riders over the past. Well, actually, actually, we'll be celebrate. It'll be celebrating its um, fi its fiftieth anniversary 50th. this year. Mm -hmm. um, the big five zero. Is the is the fact that is the fact that's that since day one there's been a kind of defining by tragedy since, in that sense, if you want to go really far back, it it all ties back to um to the one shot manga the Skull Man. Which um, is definitely not in that aspirational kind of hero, but there's a kind of cathartic hero kind of kind of approach with um, with common with common writer to to an extent, and one would one would think that would run counter to what you mentioned about the appeal of um, Power Rangers and Super Sentai to you, but what what could you say? What was your what was your first experience with Common Rider like? Putting aside if you ended up suffering through um, Saban's attempt at Master Rider, we don't talk about that. <laughs> nope, I I didn't. I only caught that through like um, uh, people talking about it, and, and and like at anime conventions, people were showing screening it to laugh at it. It's the first time I'd ever seen Mast Rider, but um, Kamen Rider, Kamen Rider, almost as immediately as I found uh, Power Rangers on the internet, Kamen Rider was right there, or Common Rider, how you like to say it, mm -hmm. um, it was right there, um, right alongside it. The, uh, I believe Ranger Board was the first time that I got to interact with other Power Ranger fans, and I think that's where I got exposed to things outside of um, uh, just the, the Power Rangers Saban offering. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that time, at that time, Disney owned it, so. Yeah, and we're tr and we're trying we're trying to offload it and kept and kept failing. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. They kicked a lot of butt with SPD. That's oh, they, that's up oh, there they, for me. They did, but um, the story the story goes that when they got it, they init they initially thought, oh, we'll just put we'll just put this in syndication. Um, but because because of a contract clause with one of their subsidiaries, I believe it was Jetix Europe, they had to pro they had to produce. Um, more episodes, and to cut down on costs, the idea was that's where the idea to move production to New Zealand um, came about. But Disney would Disney would on again off again uh, metal in in affairs. Um, one of the one, of course one of the more one of the more amusing things is um, that is a Disney executive thinking that Tommy's key eyes stir during um Dino Thunder were hit, were him swearing <laughs> mm. which um how exactly you go from key eyes to interpreting that as swearing um is a mystery for the great minds of the universe because my mind is not great enough for that <laughs> um but can you remember what your first um ent entry when it came to when it came your first series when it came to Common Rider was Oh yeah, when I sat down to watch it fully, um, I was catching the tail end of Deno. Ah, which um, I I think you I think you can I think you can go with this that um a lo that a lot of a lot of comp there is st there is still aspects of that aspirational aspirational type of hero, although a little bit less so during the fir during the first wave of the Heisei era. For a mul for a multitude of reasons, I can't. I don't want to go into here. But a common thing is is someone defined by de some someone um, defined by tragedy, literally or figuratively, going all the way back to um, Takashi Hongo being made being forcefully made into a cyborg. Mm -hmm. Um. Of course, in so in the case of something like Deno, it's just is just an instance of ridiculously bad luck. Well, in, in its inception, from the very beginning, uh, because it does predate Super Sentai, uh, Kamen Rider really took the, um, the approach of the brawler. Um, there, was, uh, there was a time when Stan Lee and some uh, uh, associates of his were attempting to bring Super Sentai into Marvel's control. Um, they, were, they were looking at bringing over... Um, uh, not Die Ranger, the one before it. There, Bio Man. They were looking at bringing over Bio Man because Stan and himself had negotiated to bring over subtitled uh, Sun Falcon in uh, the late '80s, and that was just local in San Francisco. You couldn't get that anywhere else, but that was just there. And 
Stan was in love with the concept, right? And he, he enjoyed every aspect of what Sentai was churning out. And when they looked at, at Kamen Rider, they couldn't figure out how to sell it to kids. I mean, obviously, you sell it to kids pretty easily, right? Violent guy beating the hell out of villains, blood splurts everywhere. Sometimes people dissolve in acid. It's pretty brutal being a, vi- a villain in the Kamen Rider setting. It's pretty brutal. Don't you can get your ass on, beat. Don't get me started on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. yeah and uh, so, so they kept saying, like, he's a brawler on a motorcycle. He's a bug man brawler on a motorcycle. And they knew how to, they knew that that would look cool to little boys and little girls and everybody would like it. But the moms of America wouldn't, the censors, the toy makers would be like, wait a minute, we can't, we can't be making this, this level of violence okay to kids. The sparks flying with the, with the other Sentai guys, that's fine. That's theater violence. You have, you have two guys in rubber suits beating the hell out of each other in that early Cayman Rider. So that, the thing about the, the Cayman Rider is that it's always maintained that darker tinge of the transformation hero. Even, even Ultraman and Gridman didn't even kind of leap over into that um, uh, darkness. G- uh, Garu, Garu, I think it's Garu. Garu. Garu goes this, yeah, Garu. He goes this, goes a step further into that that transformation aspect where he's like you know an, an, an engine of destruction. So it, um, Kamen Rider just took a step forward and said, "All right, so if if um, in, in the later series, right, like around the time of Fies and around the time of, of Build in particular, it sort of took the step and said, okay, we'll be the middle ground between baby toys for Sentai.'" And like the adult statue figures for uh, Garo, mm-hmm. and that's kind of where Kamen Rider sort of stayed. They've stayed with the tragic hero that is is either experienced uh, some type of torture, or has been thrust into an incredibly emotionally tense conflict, mm-hmm. and that that's maintained its like um, you know thirteen to to seventeen year old demographic pretty well as. Um, you know, people want to see a singular guy, maybe a team of guys, fighting for their lives, and they don't generally get assisted by giant robots and gimmicks. It's kind of what they got on hand, and that's it. Did you watch the watch the attempt to localize Ryuki in the form of Dragon Knight? Yes, I did. Uh, I, I caught that, like, five or six episodes, and then I couldn't stand it. Um, uh... I, I did not I know it won awards. I know it was very popular with um, some people over here. Mm-hmm. I just don't believe that um, I don't believe that they, that they really understand the passion that has to go into the, these these um, creations. That's why Power Rangers has started to, to falter dramatically. It just doesn't have passion anymore. And and that's why the Cayman Rider or Common Rider won't come over very well is because they're not putting people that are passionate behind any of it. It's just people that want to be involved, not people that have their soul lit on fire by it. I think, I think, um, I think, bring, I think, bringing over these, bringing over these, bringing over official subs of previous series is what that, uh, like, what Shout Factor has been doing is the is the best middle ground on that front. Um, when it came to when it came to Dragon Knight, the big problem there was. Um, at least for my time zone, they put it at the t- they put it at the um, ten thirty time slot on s- mm. on Saturdays. That is the death spot. Yeah, it's around lunchtime. Mm-hmm. Kind of snacky time. Nobody's really paying attention to television anymore. Sat- yeah, still too long. Um, I'm also I'm also I was also I was also always kind of on the fence of using Ryuki. As the ba- as the basis, given how controversial um, that particular series was or in its original form, mm. which is which is something I've talked about on my other podcast in the past. But getting back to um, the cl- getting back to the Colossals now, as a, now uh, one one particular thing that I found to be to be a bit of a bold move on your part is. Unlike some who try to introduce individual ca- individual characters one by one by one and then and then do a then do a big event, you are int- you are introducing um, the ca- the whole cast of the Colossals 
in the in this particular uh, book. Yes. What what prompted what prompted the idea of do, of do, of hitting the ground running like that? Uh, at the time uh, when I was developing all this back in 2019, I I uh, w had started out with Star Supreme in this in this universe, mm -hmm. and so um, when I was thinking of like adventures for her to go on, this is that this time was a teenage Star Supreme, probably around the time around the age of uh, Supergirl. And it just as I'm building the world around her in order to make her stories very interesting and compelling and not very, you know, repetitive, I realized that, man, there's a lot of potential in this in this little pocket I've created here. What else will shake out? And pretty soon I had a, a Justice League Avengers uh, uh, authority of my own. I had a, I had a complete team that, that met those typical archetypes with these characters, and I said... Okay, I like this a lot better than trying to solo a teenage superhero in like some 22-page romp. So I said, all right, I'll make it something epic. And it was about that time that the Snyder Cut started getting circulated. Like, not like it came out, but it started being like the hashtag, release the Snyder Cut, it started becoming a really big protest. So I started taking a look at what Zack Snyder's approach was, and I studied it. His, his, thought, his theory was... Well, these people understand these superheroes. I don't need to give you an origin story anymore. We tried that with Man of Steel, and it just pfft, kind of worked out, kind of didn't. So let's let's just keep going with this presumption that you you get it. These guys are heroes. They're getting together. They're going to go on an adventure, and then they're going to split apart, come back together again, split apart, and then come back together again. It's going to be the zigzag maneuver he was doing. And I said, okay, so he fucked it up by getting full of himself. This is a good theory. Because I've taken the, the iconic nature of, of superheroes. There's a hundred years of them, you know? Mm. It's not like I need to explain to you how, how a speedster works. You, you know that. You know speed is, is key. And so I don't need to explain to you how, like, spider leg, giant spider legs work. You kind of get how giant spider legs work. I do need to explain to you what the personalities of these characters. And so that's why the team works the best, because through working together, their personalities are able to be exposed. So that's when I committed to it. I said, this is the way to do it. This is how you jumpstart a multiverse the size of Marvel and DC. This is how you do it right here. Yeah. Now, with, with, that, with that kind of thing in mind, I'd like to, I'd like to go... I'd like to go into a bit of the of the backdrop when it comes to e when it comes to each of the characters that compose this that compose this team known as the Colossals. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, obviously not going into the not going into the full spiel with them, but just but just the import just the important bits. So, uh, uh, go ahead. Sure. If you do, you want me to list them, or would you like to ask me and I'll tell you? Um, I'm going. I'm going to. I'm going to ask because I'm going off of the list on the um uh, on the Go Go page. Yep. Um. So I'll start at the top with Star Supreme. Uh, Star Supreme is the leader of the Colossals. Uh, very briefly, uh, she made her appearance ten years ago before this story started, uh, saving people from a gigantic tectonic event. And that's where people became aware of her and what she's capable of. Mm -hmm. And uh, she she's been a beloved figure since then. And this uh, this team she's put together here is made up of her family and friends. Mm -hmm. Um, when I when I look at her, I get I get a I get a very a, a very super family um vibe from her. Yes. Um. And there's there's millions of Superman archetypes. Uh, Star Supreme it does not drift too far away from that in her like role, and and in the uh, the center to her purpose, right? Where Superman sort of um, uh, em emphasizes uh, hope, Star Supreme emphasizes a faith in a better tomorrow. In my experience, and what helped me survive the crap I've been through is, I had to let go of hope and have faith. I had to have faith that one of these tomorrows might not be tomorrow, might not be next week, might not be next year. But one of these tomorrows would be better than today, and it'll damn sure be better than yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, Shadow Spinner. Uh, Shadow Spinner is the adopted daughter of Star Supreme. Uh, about uh, 
eight, seven years ago now, uh, Star Supreme, in this setting, uh, Star Supreme rescued Shadow Spinner from catacombs in Siberia, where she was held by her grandfather and used to cannibalize his torture victims. Uh, she has giant spider legs poking out of her back, and um, she's so her design is based off of Nosferatu. Mm -hmm. So she is she is hairless as a, as it is. A, I forget the name of it now, and I'm so sorry, but it's a it's a real disease. So you can be born with no hair, not a not a not a single hair. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of her gimmick is that she eats magic. Now, next would be um, Isaac. 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 Yep, Isaac. He's uh, Star Supreme's adopted son. Mm -hmm. About uh, five years ago, he joined uh, the family. He was originally designed to... Uh, I'll back up. Isaac is the world's first electronic life. He was um, originally uh, an unborn child when his mother was killed during the Cataclysm. And he was digitized using a uh, experimental technology that transferred. It took a, a, a large electrical shock. It takes a, takes a snapshot of the brain and then traps it in code. He was uploaded into what I, the matrix, which is what I call the inner in my setting. And he was born there. Uh, terrorists kidnapped him from there and put him in a body built to kill Star Supreme. But his innocent heart went over and in the firefight of his escape, Star Supreme was attracted to the uh, the factory where he was built and uh, rescued him. Before he, uh, he was falling asleep for the first time in his life, and he asked Star Supreme to keep him safe while he fell asleep. And she swore to him that she would watch over him every night for the rest of his life. Yeah. So um, next would be Hypercussion. This is Star Supreme's cousin? Uh, his name is uh, Jean-Paul Jean Lindy, J.P. Lindy, uh, Hypercussion. His abilities are super speed. Uh, J.P. runs uh, hypersonic speeds. And he also has a, uh, a special ability to, to project condensed sound waves from his palms that he uses offensively, defensively, and to change direction rapidly in the in event of a fight or a need to, uh, of course, change direction rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, JP uh, works for a government agency exploring a giant spaceship fused into the core of the Earth. Uh, he uses his super speed to outrun the weaponry on board the ship and provide hypersonic, uh, uh, excuse me, provide sonic um, imagery of the interior of the ship. Um, JP is currently engaged mm -hmm. and uh, living happily in eastern Maine. Um, Razor. Yeah, Razor. Uh, his name is J uh, James Jimmy Nakamura. Uh, he's a uh, first-generation Japanese immigrant. Um, he uh, Razor came into Razor is the collections agent of the uh, Demon King Bale. Um, this is a very dark chapter here. Razor. Razor, uh, as a young boy, he and his sister were attacked on their way home from an arcade by a group of human traffickers. They struck him over the head with a crowbar to kill him, and were going to take his sister away from him. Um, in the struggle, they broke her neck, but they were going to get their um, use out of her. And Razor, using his uh, special talent, he called out to the uh, the king of demons, Bale, and sold his soul for ultimate revenge on his sister's killers. And from that point on, observing Razor's pure, unadulterated rage, Bale decided to give him as a job as a collector of souls for it. So mm -hmm. when your contract's up, Razor gets sent after you. After seeing what Star Supreme was capable of, Razor decided to join up with her, deciding to be a hero instead of face of death mm -hmm. so um, next would be Sola Vera Sola Vera she is uh, she's sort of like my Green Lantern archetype mm 
um, she has the ability to generate um, constructs out of the flames in her body. Mm -hmm. Sola's skin is uh, dark star material. The flames coming off of her head are not hot. They are like a magical fire that's rising up off of her. Mm -hmm. um, fire generates from her, from her forearms. Anywhere she generally wants to, she can generate fire for weaponry, uh, uh, safety, shields, uh, entertainment even. Um, it can be switched from fire to, uh, excuse me, from hot to just a general physical flame. Mm -hmm. um, Sola's backstory is that she grew up in a deep part of the Amazon jungle. Uh, isolated uh, and worshipped by a tribe that believed her to be a fire goddess. Until meeting Star Supreme, she was unable to fly and thus had no idea there was a world beyond her tribe. Um, a group of poachers are what led Star Supreme to the tribe where, where Sola was uh, being worshipped. And of course, confronted with the, uh, the actual world around her, Sola was enamored and insisted on returning to America mm -hmm. and Know, immigrating properly and of course becoming part of the experience mm -hmm. and last would be Delilah Church Delilah is the most enigmatic enigmatic of the uh, the colossals Delilah is a sorceress who hoards magic she runs a magic shop in Bangor Maine that has a special spell casted over it that it prevents you from remembering it after you look away from it. So if you're walking down the street and you see a store in Bangor, Maine, and you see a store titled Hidden Treasures, and you blink for a moment and look down to your shoes, well, you've suddenly forgotten all about that place and ever seeing it, and on you go. Delilah fashions herself as an immortal sorceress who used to be a Spanish princess in the 12th century uh, Kingdom of Lyon, which now belongs to France. Um, she... Um, she c collects this, uh, this magic and traps it inside of jewelry, and then she imprisons magic users who refuse to conform and uh, magical beasts inside of books inside of her store. Mm -hmm. oh. Very Carmen San Diego, Doctor Strange collision. Yeah, I could, I, I could, I can certainly, I can certainly see that. Um. Although maybe, although maybe with a bit, although I could easily see her rivaling um, Constantine's list of people who don't like who don't like her. <laughs> yes, yeah, been around for a while. Um, and and pro and prob probably probably the feeling is mutual since well that's one of the things I I always enjoy I always enjoyed about about um, Constantine somebody who's who tr who tries to be nice but is but doesn't but that doesn't mean he has to um he has to use the nicest tactics when he when um when he doesn't have a whole lot of adva doesn't have the typical advantage and has a long illustrious list of list of people who he's either screwed over or he or have screwed him over uh, exactly and you can be rest assured that most of those people are in the books in her store all, all the reason, all the reason to keep it on tight, on tight, the um, store itself on t on tight wraps because, well, if any one of them gets out, they'd be they'd be gunning for her first. Well, and when you're thinking of a magical repository that doubles as a prison for every big bad that ever went hocus pocus, mm -hmm. uh, you don't think Maine? Maine doesn't come to mind, wouldn't you know? No, you'd think more often than not, I'd more often than not, I'm pretty sure someone would shack up in the Big Easy. Um, now one of the, now given that these given that the setup with with the colossal's book that you're do that you're doing involves involves this um, family of heroes um, going up going up against a a set of duplicates. Um, mm -hmm. Would it be fair? Of, I know it's I know it was kind of hinted at with some of the material on the Indiegogo page, but. Would it be fair to say Secret Wars was a was a major influence, and were there other major event comic style books that were influences on what you're doing? Um, well, I, I can't really say that that Secret Wars is a is an inspiration for it. It's it's one of those happy accidents. To be honest with you, I took more inspiration from most of the Sentai series, where there was a evil Sentai team that was a exact copy of the first one, Time but evil. 
No, so not yeah. Time, not, um, actually, actually, I take it back. Not not Time Ranger. It was Mega Ranger that that pulled that. Um, yeah, the Psycho Rangers. This is it's a very good, very good um, comparison. Yes. Yep. Which is yep. will always be something interesting to me because that's the only time that was done. <laughs> it's the, well, you know, all these years later, that kind, it, that kind of thing still hasn't been done since. And it still captivates us the the possibility there. And see, that's that's kind of the, that's kind of the point of all this is that I, I try to go in and sew in enough um, mythos in this to make you wonder if these clones are evil or not, if they're in charge of themselves or not. Mm -hmm. You might not know until later on. Yeah. It might not be yes, it might not be no, but the way I have these clones constructed is that um, only one of them has, a, uh, has sort of an autonomy about them. The others are wholly and entirely dedicated to the emotional, mental, and physical destruction of the other Colossals. Mm -hmm. But Nega Supreme is wholly and entirely her own force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Now, with that, with that, kind, of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind, um, you're, now you're shooting, for, you're shooting for, I think, I think around 47, 57 pages, correct? 57 pages of content, 64 because of how print shops work. All right. All right. Given that, um, and given all the given all the moving parts that you've that you that you're handling with this, mm -hmm. um, how do you make how do you make sure that you don't o that you don't overwhelm the reader? Well, that's just it. Is that the story is very dense, but I keep it intimate. Mm -hmm. I make sure that we're staying with the colossals until I need to expand the the crisis. And when I expand the crisis, it's at a pivotal moment. It serves its purpose, and you understand why it pivoted the way it did. Mm -hmm. um, I made sure to to have um, quite a few eyes take a look at this to make sure that um, you know more than five people were satisfied with it. that. If 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 it didn't score solid tens, it at least stayed above a six, and. Uh, People, people gave me some very glowing reviews on it. One thing that is very apparent about this is it's dense. You will, you will find more about it as you read through it again. When you go through it the first time, the way I pace it is uh, we drop into overdrive right after that, uh, that uh, shark monster battle. Like The shark monster battle gets you introduced to the heroes, their powers, and, and how they interact with each other. A little bit of their personalities show up. That's the purpose of this whole shark monster thing is in order to get you accom accustomed to like, okay, so the Superman archetype acts this way, the Batman archetype acts this way, the Flash archetype acts this way, the Spider-Man archetype acts this way. You know, you, you, sp you get the idea. I understand the powers. Ah, so that's how they're different from their count the, the people that they were inspired by. I get that. Mm -hmm. So you're going to read through this because it's going to move so fast on you. That when you go back through it again, you'd be like, oh, I missed that completely. Or because that's what I kept getting from people was on the third read, it was like, holy crap, I now now understand every one of these characters. Yeah. Um in some in some comics in the back in the back end, there's 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 um there's little little asides or some or sometimes sketches. Um is there going to be anything like that since you mentioned having to bump it up to 64 pages for printing reasons? Yeah, I'm working on um, um, commissioning art and and writing up uh, bios for each of the heroes to go in the back so you get a bit more expanded history on them and their stats, like their height, their age, some of, like not concrete details on their powers because I'm, you know, I want to make sure I know what it looks like before I decide that, you know, 20 billion quintillion tons, you know, is what Star Supreme can lift, you know, something ridiculous like that. Mm -hmm. I just want to know what it looks like before I start hammering down those, those hardline details. But the bios will inform you about who they are and, and how they interact with the other people. And I, um, this is one very special image that I want to finish off the book with that really clues you into who Star Supreme is. Mm -hmm. And... With that, with that kind of thing in mind, um, since you meant you mentioned you mentioned doing those kind of write ups, one of the things that instantly came came up in my head was the old um the old power grid um system that was system that was in 
Marvel comics in the in the nineties and a bit and a bit of the eighties. Um, I'm not familiar. Bas basically, they tr they um it was an experiment that they tr that they tried to do that didn't stick that didn't last past the two thousands, um at least at least in an official capacity. But they were trying to they were trying to codify the relative powers of the characters throughout their throughout their universe. Mm -hmm. Um, giving, doing a kind of out of out of ten for strength, spe speed, and in intellect. The, the are the typical kind of things. Um, and they tried to use yeah. That. Go ahead. The the power rating thing kind of gets crazy. Like Toriyama talked about it. Like the, the, the scouters and stuff were a neat idea in the beginning, but it just is so ridiculous now. It wouldn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Um. When it comes down to it, I want to be able to give like people like a solid um, idea of what can happen, right? Mm -hmm. I won't spoil the end of the book, but Star Supreme's full power will be on display, and um, you get you get a really clear picture of what she's capable of. I gotcha. Now, with with that um, with that with that said, you mentioned you mentioned um, putting this thing through fe through feedback and the like. Um, what were in when you would, when you started submitting say early drafts of that kind of thing? What were some of the big learning experiences you had with it? Um, well, I I had to go through the whole process because I was a fan fiction writer. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, it was long form, so I had to learn uh, comic book pacing. That was a massive learning curve, and I'm I'm very glad that I was instructed to write five pagers beginning middle and end totally condensed i was able to condense them down into one pagers and and you'll get those with uh, the updates with the colossals because i just can't help but churn out content and uh so the uh the pacing was a massive learning curve for me um, I already had like a vision of what the characters were like and how they should look, and I went to a designer to really help me flesh those out, Mr. M. Ferdy. Very good, very good um, eye for detail, fashion as well. Um, and once I had that vision in my head, it was just really easy. I learned as a writer, I get along much easier when I can visualize, I can look at the character and decide, okay, so their cape moves this way in this panel, or they're jumping this way or their face is, is contorted into this expression. You know, I, I, I function much better there. That was a big learning curve, but you know, a lot of it, it's, it's kind of rudimentary, you know, but it's, um, I, I guess the best thing that, um, putting a comic book together, the widest thing open is that, um, people genuinely can fall in love with your creation. Mm-hmm. That was the biggest learning thing for me is that uh, I haven't put out a book yet, but there are people that want to read it. I'd Huge say, learning curve for me. Would you say that? Would you say that uh, that wanting to read it is, in some ways, or in some ways, a response to how oversaturated the cathartic hero has got has gotten over the last twenty years? Um, I would really point toward passion. Because again, the cathartic hero is devoid of passion. That you know, their their cry, their their murderous acts might be, but uh, that doesn't. They don't have passion. They're not passionate about what they're doing. They don't feel their souls light on fire, and that's that's. Um, I think people feel that when they when they look at my stuff, they see the passion and they see the characters themselves expressing passion and power, mm -hmm. and uh, that gets people interested. They haven't seen heroes like this. They aren't. Uh, they're not going to go blasting people's heads off. They're not a parody. They're not uh, carbon copies of the Avengers and Justice League. They have their own individual characterizations that come right down to their visuals. And uh, I think that's what brings a lot of people to the table is I, I know what I'm getting out of this book already before I buy it, I think is what people think see, see in it. Yeah. Now... With with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'd like to ask a bit about the, the about a bit about the theme here, the call that is that is on the Indiegogo page. How did how did that particular thing come about? Uh, I am a musically driven writer. 
uh, in order to like squeeze every drop of emotion out of everything I'm doing, especially with a visual medium like comics, I really lean hard into music. Mm-hmm. And it occurred to me like, you know, I don't have uh, a Star Supreme punching the bad guy into the stratosphere um, theme. I don't have some bombastic thing that just blares out when, when the, the, the final strike happens, you know? And I said, well, Fiverr's a place on Earth. So I went over there, and wouldn't you know, someone who was just starting out over in the Czech Republic, Miss Michelle uh, Gebauer, Gebauer I, I, I could be saying it very wrong, but uh, in, the, in the Czech Republic, um, or Czechoslovakia, I don't know what they call it now, but oh, uh, I just she the Czech Republic. was, yeah, the Czech Republic, she was a, incredibly excited about this whole thing. Uh, the, the characters really just inspired her, and not being a native English speaker, she, uh, she kind of went with what felt right for her, and man, just a home run with that, like just belting out those lyrics, man, and that... And she said it, it reminded her of, uh, of a classic anime she used to watch, and uh, she couldn't get the tune out of her head. So away she went with Hear the Call, and damn, it makes my, it makes my hair stand on the back of my neck. It's so awesome. Mm-hmm. So with, now, um, with, all, with all of that in mind, um, now I know, I, know it's, I know you currently have it in the, in the sign-up phase, but when... But... When are you planning to launch, and how much are you shooting for as far as the, as far as a tar- as far as a um, monetary target? Uh, you mean for like buying the book? Um, either buying or for or for ordering on Indiegogo. All oh, right, by uh, the order through Indiegogo. Yeah. So, um, I am a perfectionist. I have pretty much everything ready to go. But I need to make sure that in my heart of hearts and my soul of souls that this campaign visually is expressing everything I need it to in order for you, the consumer, to feel fire burning in your own soul. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the goal is to, is to light people's imagination on fire, to, to give them no other resource there. So I'm trying to um, recourse. I'm trying to uh, really hammer home this, this campaign. Uh, to get in the book, I'm I, I'm I'm going to go to offer oh, the digital thing right out of the gate, because international has become a mess with this VAT tax business, mm-hmm. and I don't want to cut out people that uh, genuinely are interested in the story and can uh, can wait on a physical until we can figure out how to get it overseas. So digital is going to be right out of the gate at fifteen dollars, mm-hmm. and uh, the physical is uh, the twenty five. Um, a go situation. It comes with the uh, the PDF. So as soon as the the book is colored, lettered, f- and uh, formatted appropriately, uh, that'll be available as a PDF to everybody. No need to wait for the book to come with it. I I find that people get really excited in the story and they want to read it as soon as it's done. I don't need to make them wait because mm-hmm. uh, the PDF comes with every tier, every you know book tier. So you um, you get the PDF no matter where you back. So. And I'll, I'll um, I'll, cer- I'll certainly be lo- I'll certainly be looking forward to th- to that particular setup, um, but with o- with all of that said, um, I would I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Uh, the air is very clear and crisp. And. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further discuss the co- the colossals, to to um to for, to continue to bury the um the the um spring the brief that brief flirtation with spring movies, you know which ones, mm. <laughs> or, yeah. or 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 um which or something in between, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Sounds like a plan to me. I appreciate the invite to come back. It's lovely here. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, 
My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.